When you bow your head to us as we pray. Father, the hour has come that I must stand between you and your people. You have been speaking to my heart. And so today as I open your word before your people, I pray that the same conviction that you have brought on my heart, that you would bring it on their hearts. And that as we open the word, you are going to step out from within the pages and step inside of their hearts and help us to understand and teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. There are two types of wombs. One we call self-inflicted wombs. Wombs that one may have inflicted upon himself or herself as a result of his or her action. Secondly, we have wounds caused by the decisions and actions of others. And the injury from both types of wounds can be very painful. But the most painful wound are the ones that have been deliberately inflicted upon us by our friends. And there are many of God's children who are still hurting from wounds caused by people, people who at one time or the other were near or dear to us. Perhaps a relative, maybe a classmate, or maybe a co-worker, maybe a spouse, or a child, a son or daughter. Perhaps we may have been seriously wounded in church. Maybe we've been hurt or betrayed or defrauded or humiliated or violated, or wounded by a church member. Maybe by an elder. Maybe a Sabbath school teacher. Maybe the AY leader. Or who knows, maybe the pastor. None is exempt. And those, should I say, of us, or people of God, or, or those of God's children who have been wounded, cannot bring themselves to forgive those who inflicted the wounds upon us. We are pain and bitter and angry at what happened to us and at those who caused it. And we feel justified to withhold forgiveness. I could never forgive her. Or I could never forgive him. But I want to say to the church, saints of God, as painful as our wounds may be, there is another wound that is even worse. And that is the wound we inflict upon ourselves by the decision not to forgive the person who may have wronged us. That's the greatest wound. Maybe we can call this sin, and notice I say sin, maybe we can call the sin of not willing to forgive Suicidal wounds. Suicidal wounds. Now, the Bible questions the legitimacy of, 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 the, of 
of the healing of people who claim to have experienced God's forgiveness. And yet, we still cherish an unforgiving spirit towards those who wound us or are wound us. How can this be? If we claim to have uh, uh, benefited from Christ's forgiveness, why is it that we cannot bring ourselves to the point where we are not willing to forgive those who have offended us? Listen to me, brethren. If someone has hurt you, listen to me very carefully here. If someone has hurt you and you are still struggling to forgive that somebody, it means that the wound is still open. It is not healed. It is still bleeding. You see, healed wounds do not bleed. They don't bleed. Listen very carefully what I'm going to say to us this, today. To forgive or not to forgive are choices that we must make. To decide, not to decide, is a decision. If you read through the Bible, you would discover that the word forgiveness is a legal term used 143 times in the New Testament. It means to release a person from an obligation. When used in a financial context, it carries the idea of canceling a debt. Forgiveness always involves a choice. Unforgiveness is also a choice. As such, it has consequences. May I say to us today, you know, everybody in this church, as you know, they told me that before, never say everybody, but let me change this. Almost everybody in this church is worried about coming down with cancer. Whether you are meat eater, whether you are vegetarian, Whatever you are, cancer seems to be killing everybody these days. But let me say this to you. Unforgiveness is as dangerous as cancer. It eats us from the inside. Have you ever, am I talking anything strange here? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where someone has hurt you and you have not yet yourself to the point where you can say hey listen man let's make up this together let's put this behind our back you know how you feel every time you see that person and sometimes you can stand in front of the door and you're greeting people and this person is coming in he or she takes a different route it eats us away from the inside it deprives us of a peace of mind it holds us in perpetual bondage to someone who wounded us. And the Bible makes it abundantly clear that anyone who is not willing to forgive those who may have wronged them will themselves not be forgiven. By God, serious thing, isn't it? Matthew chapter 6, in case you want to check on me to see whether I'm speaking the truth. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, if we choose not to forgive, if we choose not to forgive, nor let go of something that is eating us up inside, we are actually committing Spiritual suicide. So how can we be set free from our unforgiveness? What should we do when we find it very difficult to forgive those who, who have deliberately wounded us? How should we deal with anger or pain? 
a hurt? How should we treat that person who uh, has seriously hurt us and, and yet come back claiming uh, that he or she is sorry? What about the ones who still remain unrepentant? Are we expected to forgive them also? You know, those wounds are still fresh. They're affecting us. I'm saying what we're talking about today, it's not about theoretical answers because all of us know the right answers to give. All of us know that we ought to urge and encourage and strengthen our brethren to do what is right. But the question is, when it falls in our plate, what happens? Those wounds are still fresh. Even when we say we forgive someone, Sometimes, you know, sometimes we say, well, yeah, I, I, I have forgiven him, but I want to have nothing to do with him again. I wonder how it would sound to us if we get on our knees and we confess our sin and we say, Lord, you know, I have offended Sister Guthrie and, I, 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 you know, please give me the, the power and the strength to go to her and say, Sister Linda, listen, I, I'm very sorry, but Lord, I, you know, I, I want to have nothing to do with her again because she has hurt me so badly. How would we feel if after we get up from our knees, the Lord says, I have heard your voice. I have heard your prayer. And I want you to know that I have forgiven you, but I want to have nothing to do with you to do again. How would it? We sometimes don't want to have anything whatsoever to do with those who have hurt us. So how can we, if this is the attitude, how can we be set free from those emotions? You know, saints of God, we ought to pray and ask God to give us the power and the strength to let go of the hurt and let go of the bitterness so that we can enjoy the joy of reconciliation and peace. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you had to genuinely go to someone and say, listen, let's put this behind my back. Uh, can't you remember the, the spring you had in your steps when that was done? It was something that you were struggling for the longest while, you wished for the longest while, you didn't know how the person would respond, but you got a good reception, and now this thing is behind you, and you're walking out there as though some burden has been rolled off your shoulders. So why must we let go of the hurt and the, pit and, 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 and the bitterness? The Bible says we must forget, we must forgive and forget. And I'm going to touch on that just now. You know, the answer to these questions involve a very painful choice. A very painful choice. But it is a choice that sets us free and secures our own forgiveness when we forgive others. And the Bible offers us several reasons why we should forgive those who may have wronged us. But I want to concentrate on what I consider to be the most compelling reason why we ought to forgive those who have wronged us, those who have hurt us. And that reason is we must forgive and forget for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. In fact, whatever we do as a Christian must be motivated for, by for Christ's sake. The way I treat, Sister Paul, and the way I treat you is not because you're a rich person and you have a nice house and plenty of money and you have status. I must not treat you that way uh, because of what you have. I must treat you a certain way because you are a child of God. You know, sometimes we know the poor ones in our congregation. We don't even spend time to have a conversation with them. They can't offer us anything. Anybody see us talking with them, they would think nothing. 
but we want to be among those who have status. The bright ones, the rich ones, the high and the mighty, this is sin. It is sin. We treat people the way we treat them because every child, every daughter is a child of God. And so we must forgive for Christ's sake. And whatever we do must be motivated by Christ. And so one of the reasons why Seventh-day Adventists in certain parts of the world is so cold is because we treat people a certain way based on their status. We must treat people the way we treat them for Christ's sake. And there is a story in the, that can be found in the Bible that we will be looking at. It's taken from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. Lovely story. Uh, maybe some of you may have skipped over it several times, but we will be looking a little bit on that today as we make the point. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I would like to look at that. I want you to turn in your Bibles. So 2 Samuel chapter 9 begins with a frantic question from King David. David has now become king. Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. And David begins chapter 9. Notice what it says here. Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for whose sake? Jonathan's sake. Watch that name. We're going to get back to the meaning of that name just now. Apparently, King David had been searching for someone from the household of his worst enemy, Saul. You know the story. How many times Saul attempted to kill David? But now David becomes king. He wants to show kindness to Saul's descendants for Jonathan's sake. Why does David... What, does, what David does not know, what David does not understand, is that there is only one descendant of Saul that's left. When I, you know, every time you read that, listen, Saul's entire tribe was almost wiped out in battle. And then one person that's left, he is crippled. A young man named Mephibosheth. The son, he was the son of Jonathan, uh, the grandson of, of, of the late King Saul. At that time, at that time of David's inquiry, Mephibosheth is married and is living in exile. In a faraway town called, the Bible calls the place Lodebar. The Bible offers only a brief account of how Mephibosheth became crippled. 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. You would read why. Yeah. 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4 says, And Jonathan Saul's son had a son who was lame on his feet. He was five years when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So his nurse, his nurse look, I understand the drama as it unfolds here. With the sudden change in the palace, Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. His tribe is wiped out. The nurse now takes little Mephibosheth and says, listen, David is going to come after you. He wants this kingdom. He is going to kill you. Let me run with you. And in running, he fell from her hand. Damage his spine. So Mephibosheth is, is there now. Young boy, still five doesn't understand fully what's happening. His father does not come home. His grandfather does not come home. And the boy begins to cry. He suddenly realizes, hey, listen, there is no daddy's cuddle any longer. Grandpa is not there for me to play on his knees. 
and worse yet, I would never be able to walk again. I would never be able to run and jump and play like all the little children do. He longed for a cuddle from his dad, uh, Jonathan, and from his granddad, Saul. He cries himself to bed, and when he dozes off, he is suddenly awakened with nightmares. Yet no one is ready to disclose the facts to this five-year-old boy. No one except his royal nurse. You know, sometimes, saints of God, when we allow people to do for us what we should do for ourselves, it creates a lot of confusion. So the royal nurse says to him, and I can almost hear the royal nurse explain to Mephibosheth, daddy and granddad would not be coming home again because they went to fight and their enemies killed them. I can hear her whispering to Mephibosheth, you could become the next king of Israel. So listen, I have to hide you. We have to leave. We have to leave immediately to avoid you getting killed by David and his men. But Mephibosheth cannot understand why. Why David? He knew that David came to visit his father, Jonathan, on several occasions. David may, may, may have taken little Mephibosheth in his arms. That was his friend's son and gave him a little kiss and a pat on his head. Why David? Is not David my father's best friend? Listen, Mephibosheth, explained the royal nurse. David hates you. He wants to kill you. He wants to take the kingdom that belongs to you and your dad and your granddad. He hates you because your granddad hated him and tried to kill him. Now David is going to seek revenge. He's going to kill you. That's why we have to leave immediately. I can imagine the nurse charging him, listen as you grow, please don't tell anyone whom you belong to. They must not know that you are Jonathan's son. They must not know that you are attached to any royal line. No one must know while you are still alive. But one day, Mephibosheth, I want to let you know, you are going to be brought back to, to Israel. The throne will be yours again. Listen, saints, from the age of five, when that nurse ran with Mephibosheth, when she tried to brainwash him into believing that David hated him and wanted to harm him, and, uh, you know, Mephibosheth began to, to feel anger against, uh, towards David. His level of hate for David began to rise. While this was happening, on the other hand, David was looking for someone. I want you to get a picture here. Mephibosheth's mind is poisoned against David. But David is looking for someone to offer special honor on the descendants of Saul, the man who really hated him. So watch the drama. On the one hand, Mephibosheth is brainwashed and he develops hate for David. On the other hand, David is searching the land to find someone from his household, of, from the household of Saul. That he can show kindness. Second Samuel chapter 9 and verse 1. Notice what, what the Bible says here. Second Samuel 9 and verse 1. And David says, is there still anyone who, fills, who, who is left of the household of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David's inquiring. David searched for Mephibosheth. And his search took several years, but he did not give up. In fact, by the time George, uh, David found him, and you would find that in verse 12 of chapter 9, by the time David found Mephibosheth, <laughs> Mephibosheth was a young man who had a child, a son, by the name of Micah. For many years, the king is thinking, inquiring, and searching for the lost and the crippled son of his friend. And not long afterwards, David's intelligence would tell him, listen, we have found some traces. There is a guy named Ziba, as you would read in the Bible. He is a former employee of Saul. 
and he would help locate Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. You would read the story in, 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 in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 2 to 5. Lovely story to read. You can check that when you get home. Then David, the Bible says, David sent and fetched him out of the house of uh, 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 Micah, uh, the son of Amiel from Lodibar. All right? Now, the Bible's account of the meeting of, of Mephibosheth and David reveals how, how hatred is swallowed up by love and how fear is swallowed up by trust. And you would read that story in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 6 to 11. It says, when, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, uh, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face. And did reverence, David. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show kindness uh, for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba. Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Therefore, and thy son, thy servant shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But for Mephibosheth, thy master's son, he shall always eat bread at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons, and 20 servants, the Bible says. So he had to walk the land for Mephibosheth. As for Mephibosheth, the Bible says, uh, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Why was Jonathan so kind and loving to Mephibosheth? Verse 7 answer the question. For Jonathan's thy father's sake. David took his avowed enemy, restored him his estate, of his grandfather Saul, all right, allowed Mephibosheth to live with him in the palace, and, and David treated him like one of his own sons. Though Mephibosheth is lame on his feet, he's unsightly. He did not seem to have any great fitness for service, yet for Jonathan's sake, David took him to be one of his own family. The account of King David's treatment to Mephibosheth teaches some important lessons. Number one, in the phrase, for Jonathan's sake, we find the most compelling motivation to forgive others. You know, the name Jonathan means gift of God. Maybe the next child somebody has here, yeah, some son, you might want to call him Jonathan. The name means gift of God. Whenever we read in the account in uh, uh, 2 Samuel 9, uh, for Jonathan's sake, it actually means for Christ's sake. In other words, if we are looking for a reason to forgive someone uh, of the ill they have, uh, we have suffered at that person's hand, the answer lies in, in what Jesus, our divine Jonathan, has done for us. Amen. Those who understand the price Christ paid on Calvary, for the sins, will not stubbornly withhold forgiveness from those who have hurt them. That's why the most forgiven person ought to be the most forgiven person. You know, sometimes we think that when we forgive others, it's a sign of weakness. And who wants to be perceived as an easy pushover? Or a doormat? Listen to me. Forgiveness is never born out of weakness. It takes a person who is strong in faith and love for God to forgive someone who has hurt him badly. Only those with resolute conviction and sterling character can truly forgive. On the other hand, as long as we choose not to forgive, we become the slaves of those who have hurt us. Forgiveness is not forgetting. All right? So forgiveness is not about weakness. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. Forgetting is to lose 
the remembrance or recollection of something or someone. It is a passive process in which the passing of time can cause a thing to fade away from memory. Forgiving, however, is not the result of am amnesia. I read in Dr. Pippin, Samuel Pippin's book entitled Heal Wounds and uh, Ugly Scars. He says forgiveness is an active process in which a person makes a conscious choice not to mention, recount, or think about the injury one has suffered from another. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, I'm going to race towards the end in five minutes. I, I even I am he that blotted out thy transgression for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. God says he's going to do it for his own sake. He does not mean that he cannot remember our sins. It means that he will not remember them. It is a conscience choice on his part to not reckon those sins against us nor take action on them. But the good news, however, is that when we make a conscious decision to forgive and to stop dwelling on the offense of the other, the Lord works a miracle in us so that the hurt we have suffered begin to lose the bite on us to the extent that the painful memories, they fade away. Amen. And then you remember them no more. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It is not a, fle a fleeting emotional experience. It is a conscious choice, an act of the will. There are two Greek words that translate forgiveness. The first one is a fiemai. It means to let go or to release or to remit. It is a term uh, used to describe full payment or cancellation of the debt, according to Vine's Bible Dictionary. The other word is charisomai, which means to bestow favor freely or unconditionally. The term suggests uh, that forgiveness is an act of grace. It is undeserved and cannot be earned. Both terms imply that the one doing the forgiven suffers from loss, suffers from some loss of pain. Uh, that is what happened at Calvary, you see. When, when, when Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, chose to suffer uh, and, and die in order to secure our forgiveness, he suffered pain. He suffered loss. Listen to me. The choice to let go really hurts. You know that, and I know that. When someone does something to us, it hurts. It hurts to have to go to stand, but only for Christ's sake we do it. Because when Christ lives in you, you cannot not do it. You have to do it. It might be painful to let go, but we have to. And the good news is that this conscious act of the will to forgive also brings about changes in our feelings. We experience peace of mind and the joy that is there in doing God's will. And although it may hurt and forgive someone for that, uh, although it may hurt to forgive someone for that hurtful thing that was done to you, the Bible urges for Christ's sake, do it. Do the unthinkable. Observe quickly in the New Testament how many times, you know, uh, 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 the expression for Christ's sake is placed there. You would find it in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 and verse 32. We must forgive one another for Christ's sake. Romans chapter 15 and verse 30. We must pray for one another for Christ's sake. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10 says we must patiently endure trial of this life for Christ's sake. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, we must be willing to suffer for Christ's sake. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 11 says, we must be willing to die for Christ's sake. So the most compelling reason to do the right thing is for Christ's sake. The more we understand the amazing grace of God's forgiveness, the greater will be our motivation to forgive others. 
or willingness or unwillingness to forgive reveals much about us. The story, this story of Mephibosheth and David is one of the greatest illustrations of the gospel. It reveals something about the richness of God's grace. In this real story, David represents God the Father, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. David represents that. And God our Father is constantly looking to show kindness to us. He's looking for us as David looked for Mephibosheth. Though we hate him and run away from him and rebel against him, we are angry towards him, but he's looking for us. Though we deny him and fail him over and over again, and we misconstrue his intentions and plans towards us as sinners, he still loves us and is ever searching for us. The Bible says, Behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called what? Children of God. Mephibosheth, David represents God on his throne. Mephibosheth represents us, lost humanity. We also fell, not in a palace, but in a garden called Eden. And because of that fall, we cannot walk straight. We cannot think straight. We cannot talk straight. We can't do anything straight. Sin has messed us up. We hate God. We distrust him. We disbelieve his word. And we're living in exile far away from the Father's home. We are running from him while he's running after us. We were created in the image of God. And we, 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 we are degraded by sin. We feel as Mephibosheth like dead dogs. Indeed, we deserve death because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But God be praised. For the text says the gift of God is the eternal life to Jesus Christ. Jonathan represents Jesus. So remember, David represents the king, God. Mephibosheth represents us, crippled, bent. Jonathan represents Jesus. The only way we Mephibosheths can be saved is for Jonathan's sake. For Christ's sake. Remember, the name Jonathan means gift of God. It is not surprising that the greatest gift of God is in giving this world, is giving humanity the Son of God, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, you know the text, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I said earlier, as we close, anytime you read the phrase, for Jonathan's sake, it really means for Christ's sake. And the only reason why God the Father shows kindness to us, pardoning us of our sins, making us his sons and daughters, is for Christ's sake. The Bible says, I write unto you little ones, little children, because, of, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. If it is for Christ's sake that we, Mephibosheth, are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And it is also for Christ's sake that we have assurance of eternal life. The promise of his indwelling Holy Spirit and the hope of living with him forever. Today, I want to just ask you, I'm going to ask you for a commitment. Brethren, we are indeed living in closing up times. Next Sabbath is declared as a day of prayer for the church. And I want to say to each of us, listen, it would not worth losing the eternal kingdom just because we have decided to hold on to an unforgiving spirit. The church will never be able to thrive in such an environment. Let us ask God to give us the strength. Let us ask God to give us the power. Let's get on our knees this week. Let us try to make the right wrong. And God's going to bless us and bless this church. If you're in the congregation, 
And you want to say, you're not saying to me. This is a private conversation between you and God. You know what the situation is, but you want to say, Lord, I want you to give me the power and the strength. I want to put the wrongs behind. I know it's hurtful. I know what has been done to me is hurtful. It's painful, but I'm willing to put the wrongs behind and to make it to the kingdom. If this is your decision, I want you to stand. We're going to have a prayer, and then I'm going to turn over to Sister Kathy in the first help. God bless you, my sister, for standing. Shall we bow heads? Father, I have discharged the duties that you have laid on my heart. And I join with those who are standing today in asking you to forgive. Forgive us, forgive me, and forgive my brethren for the sins that we may have committed against you by not willing to forgive those who may have wronged us. You know our private life, Lord. There's nothing we can hide from you. But people have stood today. People have stood to them. They want to say, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and mercy. And I just thank you for what you have done for me. And based on what you have done for me, for Christ's sake, I am willing to forgive others. So please accept our decision today. And for those who may not have seen it fit to make that decision, I lift them up before you as well. Please be with them and bless them and continue to plead through the voice of your Holy Spirit to our hearts. For this is a prayer in Jesus' name.